Yeah, so today I'd like to talk about uh, linking weather to fuel availability. And so this is uh, one of the topics that links the, the weather forecasts into the fuels and the fire behaviour. And primarily it comes down to moisture content, and particularly the, the moisture content of fire and dead fuels, because that's the thing that determines whether fires can be ignited, and once they're burning, how they'll spread. So, uh, it, just from the point of view of terminology, fuel moisture, we're talking about the water content of those fuels, whether it be the, uh, the very fine fuels on the surface or the deeper profile. By fuel availability, we're talking about how much of that fuel is available, available to burn. Uh, and that's more commonly presented as drought factor, uh, one of the components of MacArthur's fire danger index. Uh, and so he represented that as a drought factor ranging from naught, in which case the whole litter profile was too wet to burn, uh, through to uh, teen, in which the, the whole depth of the litter layer is dry enough to burn. So it's not just about uh, particular moisture content value, but also how that moisture content value varies through different parts of the fuel. And fuel moisture is important because it has a big effect on rate of spread, as you can see from the, the rate of spread versus moisture content function from the project Vesta finals, but also for other things like uh, the amount of fuel consumption, um, which contributes to fire intensity, difficulty of suppression and carbon balance, and also processes like spotting. So um, you know, dry fuels are more likely to start watch fires. So moisture content and availability have an impact on a wide range of aspects of fire behaviour. And so that's why um, we've been putting some effort into recent years into researching these processes uh, with the aim of developing new tools to link the, uh, the weather forecasts with the fire behaviour predictions. So in terms of existing tools, um, there are a few things available. So way back in the 70s, the very first um, MacArthur Fire Danger Meter has a fuel moisture and a fuel availability model on it. So the fuel moisture model is very simple, simply a function of temperature and relative humidity. Uh, it does, you don't actually see fuel moisture on the, on the fire danger meter itself, but it's, it's there implicitly with those temperature and relative humidity wheels. And there's also a very simple fuel availability model there in the drought factor, based on simply uh, amount of rain and time since rain. Uh, I guess as, as a first go, that captures the basic processes, but it, it misses some things. For instance, it misses the uh, effects of what kind of weather we have in drying after rain, whether it's uh, mild conditions in autumn or, um, or very dry conditions in summer. Um, but it was a first go. And as we've seen from the uh, previous two talks in this session, um, the outputs of that meter are, are still in use today. There are also some other things around. There's the forest fire behaviour tables used in Western Australia. The fuel moisture model in there is a bit more sophisticated in that it doesn't take into account uh, drying conditions um, after rainfall. Uh, and of course, around the globe, there are, all, there are a number of other systems. Of particular interest, perhaps, is the, um, the fire weather index from Canada, um, which is similar in structure to the forest fire behaviour tables in that it's a, a bookkeeping method. Um, and it's also been applied outside of Canada in other parts of the world. Uh, and notably also in an experimental fashion um, for some parts of Australia, as you can see from the slide up there at the top. Uh, and then there's also the American models and particularly uh, the 10-hour the fuel moisture model, which is one of the first operationally used uh, physically based fuel moisture models based on the, the wetting and drying of a 10-hour hazard rod, so uh, about a, a half-inch um, wooden dowel. So I commented that the <coughs> The very early models were very simple, particularly the MacArthur one. It just had uh, temperature and humidity as a, affecting fuel moisture, and then rainfall and time affecting uh, fuel availability. In the period since the 1970s up to the present, uh, there's been quite a lot of research done the world, around the world in terms of trying to understand the physical processes that drive fuel moisture. So not just those basic ones, but also more complicated ones, depending on the structure of the fuel layer, and also things like solar radiation, uh, and interacting with the soil. And so at this point, uh, looking back and having recently done a, a review of these science in this area, I think we actually have a pretty good understanding now of what the processes are that drive fuel moisture. And so those basic processes um, that are there in the fire danger meter uh, are still here. So with changing temperature and humidity, we have, we have vapor exchange where water is taken up by the fuel at higher relative humidities and then removed at, as, at lower humidities during the day. And of course, um, rainfall still has an impact in, in wetting the fuels and drying through into the soil. 
Uh, so other processes that are important um, and that, that may need to be modelled are things like uh, looking in more detail at the fuel elements themselves. So when the rainfall is intercepted by the fuel, whether it's absorbed into the fuel uh, and then subsequently evaporated by vapour exchange or whether it evaporates directly. And also the effects of solar radiation. Um, so radiation that makes it through the forest canopy or directly onto the fuel through, through gaps in the canopy or for grass fuels has an effect of heating the fuel, uh, changing its temperature and therefore the relative humidity. Uh, and we also see a similar effect with thermal radiation at night time particularly, um, where that loss of radiation to the sky can cool the fuel and, and lead to dew formation. So, and then there's also finer scale processes of, of uh, mixing of water vapour and, uh, and heat through the little layer due to gradients set up by, um, by heating and cooling. So, from physical research, there are quite a few more processes than just the vapour exchange and rainfall. Um, but I think we do now understand those fairly well. And, and with some limitations, if we've got all the information that we need, we can do a reasonable job at a point of predicting fuel moisture. And, and that's with the, the caveat that we know everything about the location. So we know the weather on site under the canopy, we know the fuel load, we know its bulk density and so on. Okay, and so the challenge we're facing now is can we apply that understanding out into the, uh, into the complexities of of the real world, where we've got to deal with topography, deal with um, spatial variation in weather, uh, fine scale variation in weather, and variation in fuel structure. So my, my long answer to this question is probably going to be not yet, but we're working on it. Um, but before we get to that, um, and perhaps in the, the spirit of Alan MacArthur's having a go, um, and, and taking it down, we'd like to show the results of, of an attempt we made to apply what we know at a point um, onto the gridded weather forecasting on the assumption that things were more or less uniform. So what we did here, um, and this is in collaboration with the, the Rural Fire Service, was to stick on a, a model that represents most of these processes onto the bottom of the gridded uh, forecast explorer output that Sarah was just presenting. So what we did uh, was we took the, the four day forecast run, uh, we initialised the model, ran it for four days, and made a prediction of fuel moisture for the whole state. Uh, that was then fed into uh, MacArthur's prescribed burning guide to produce maps of possible locations for prescribed burning for the next four days. Um, what we quickly found there was that if the rainfall forecast didn't match um, observations, the things quickly went, went awry. And so we modified things then to, uh, to include a hind cast based on, on observed rainfall. And so what we did was that prior to starting the, rain, the fuel moisture forecast is we took uh, rainfall observations from the previous day along with a previously stored model state, ran the, the previous two days as a hindcast to initialise the model, then put in the weather forecast and came up with a fuel moisture forecast. Um, and what we ended up with from that project were nice maps like these or movies that look very much like the, um, the fire weather and fire danger maps that that's Sarah showed before. Uh, this was an improvement in that we're now using some of that understanding of the physical processes. What's missing is that we've had to assume that within each of those 6 by 6 k grid cells that the, that the landscape is flat and the fuels are uniform. In some places that's probably correct, in a lot of places it's not. And so the focus of our current research is understanding those cases where it's not, where there's variation in fuel structure, where there's variation in topography and what effect that has on fuels. Uh, so what I'll do now is look at some of the experimental work we've been doing to understand those differences uh, and then where that's leading us for our next generation of modelling that will not just make use of the, uh, of the good high resolution weather forecasts that we're getting now but also our understanding of the uh, ecology and fuel structure as well. So there's quite a lot of interesting observational evidence of effects of, of fuel structure on fuel moisture. So this is quite an old data set, you can see from the 1980s, um, this, which was collected by Lockie McCaw and his team in, in two forest parks in Western Australia. So this is some uh, Jarrah and Carry Forest in southwest Western Australia. And these two forest stands are located within about three kilometres of each other. So they're within a single grid cell. They're receiving more or less what we would expect to call the same weather. But you can see that the moisture content traces are quite different. So these are just for profile moisture content, so the deeper moisture content. And what we can see is that the, the Jarrah forest, which is more open, it tends to have a shallower litter layer, 
uh, dries out far more quickly than the carry forest, which is, uh, has a denser canopy and a deeper litter layer. And you can see here that the profile moisture in the Jarrah fluctuates quite rapidly um, and, and dries out within a short time after rainfall. And you can see for these observations that were started in, in autumn, um, in, you know, in early November, there's time where that fuel, you would say, is, is pretty well dry enough to burn. The carry, on the other hand, um, takes much longer to dry out. And starting off a, a higher moisture content at the start, it's really not dry enough to really carry a decent fire until well into the in, end of December. So there's a, a clear effect here of, um, of, of fuel type on fuel moisture. And again, that's within a location where everything's getting uh, the same weather above the canopy. Okay. There's also small scale variation. So these are some measurements we've been making at uh, Winmalee in the Blue Mountains, where we've been looking at variation on the scale of hundreds of metres. So there's a, a small hill here with uh, Sydney coastal dry sclerophyll forest on that, and then a, uh, a wet sclerophyll forest down just in this drainage line here. And we've had four sites, one on the ridge top, one on the north and south slopes, and then one into the gully. And we've been visiting that weekly over the previous few months and looking at differences in moisture content. Um, these results will be all the results they have for here because this was burned in the Hawkesbury Road fire a couple of months ago. Um, there'll be no validation data from this site. Um, so what we've got here is uh, surface moisture coming up the top, profile down the bottom, and, uh, and rainfall on site. Um, what we found was that with uh, rain gauges underneath the canopy, there wasn't a lot of difference between the four, four sites, so the input of rainfall was fairly similar. I don't have a chart for it, but we did find that the the wet sclerophyll site is much better at retaining moisture and so the soil moisture there is stayed much higher. Um, just from a preliminary look at the results, and we're really still working with these, um, the big difference we can see is between the, the gully site and the other three. Um, so the wet sclerophyll and the dry sclerophyll forest. And you can see here that the, the surface moisture contents and the profiles in the, in the wet forest type uh, vary quite considerably which I guess is not too much of a surprise. What we've had to do more of a surprise is there's very little difference between the North Ridge and South Sites. So you know, most of the time they track pretty closely together. And so what, this has changed our thinking a little bit about how we deal with this in that um, fine scale topography may not be the main thing we need to worry about. A lot of the time we might be able to ignore slope and aspect and really just need to think about forest type and ecology. Is it wet or dry forest type rather than North or South facing? So that's quite interesting. Uh, and not something we've tried modelling yet. So up in the wake of the Black Saturday fires, we did some reconstruction work within the team looking at reconstructing the fire behaviour. Uh, we also did some work on reconstructing the fuel moisture conditions. And so using some basic information about forest structure and also a digital elevation model to look at slope and aspect, and assuming things were pretty dry, we ran the process-based fuel moisture model over the whole landscape to see Firstly, to, to relate with the fire behaviour reconstruction, what moisture conditions were like, uh, but also to see, could we see any slope and aspect effects and were they likely to matter? Uh, so this analysis was done with, by Andrew, and what he found was that because it was the middle of summer, uh, the sun's very high in the sky, in, the, in most places the afternoon moisture content didn't really depend much on slope and aspect. It was you know, very low, 5%, um, but not a lot of difference there. Where there was a difference, um, was in the timing. So the easterly aspects, which got sun in the morning, dried out more quickly than the westerly ones. So that was an interesting theoretical result and one we thought was worth investigating further. Uh, and so we've had an honours student this year looking at, at replicating those uh, conditions in a controlled manner. So what Sarah did was she built a, an artificial landscape out of plywood. So we've got the, the four sides here in the top and we can adjust the slope there from more or less flat to about 40 degrees. Um, to replicate, replicate different um, slopes and aspects all in more or less the same condition. And this was done at the uh, Plant Breeding Institute in Sydney. And so you can see there's no canopy, so it's very simple. So the radiation that we measure with the radiometer on the weather station is after adjusting for slope and aspect um, what the fuels are receiving. And so on each of the, the four aspects on the top there, we've got six, six litter baskets. One of those has got thermocouples to measure the fuel temperature. The other five, we removed every hour away and put them back to track the moisture content during the day. And so these were done at slopes of 10, 20, 30, and 40 degrees. And so uh, this was done over winter. And so at that 
And so in July, the, the sun only gets up to about 30 degrees above the horizon. So for the steepest uh, slope tests, the southern aspect is actually shaded for the entire day. Okay, and so you see for the 40 degree experiment, pretty uh, drastic, uh, sorry, dramatic differences. So everything starts in the morning at um, around 25% moisture content, 100% uh, humidity. And you can see then that the, the north aspect, the purple one, drops off very quickly. And by the, the middle of the day, it's around, down to around 10% moisture content and, and stays there for the rest of the day. Um, whereas the the southern aspect, which is in the, in the shade all day, you know, barely changes. It stays well up above 20% all day. So with these very steep slopes, we can see that as we expect uh, with the radiation differences with slope and aspect, that we get a corresponding difference in fuel moisture. So the physical theory does work under those extreme conditions. Which raises some questions about our earlier results about um, why did we not see dramatic differences here out in the real world? So uh, we then did some more experiments at Wimberley looking at northeast, south, and west aspects. Um, so this was done in autumn. It was a dewy morning, so everything was up around 60% moisture content. And here we get a slightly different pattern. Um, here we get the, south, the north face drying out very quickly, the southern one more slowly. Okay, that's the same. Um, but then during the afternoon, there's, there are very few significant differences here, particularly the, the north east and west, which are all getting some sun, have more or less the same moisture contents. The southern one here, the sun was low enough the sky, in the sky that it was in the shade. Um, so this suggests that in the, real, in the real world, where uh, slopes with any fuel on them tend to be uh, less than 40 degrees, that we, we may not see such dramatic differences. And that kind of confirms our earlier result that uh, forest type may matter more than topography. Uh, and so these are just looking in a bit more detail at that uh, fuel temperatures and radiation from the north and south slopes. Uh, you can see here the fuel temperatures on the southern one are, are depressed until the middle of the day when there's a break in the canopy. The sun gets over the top of the hill, the fuel heats up, and, um, and that's where we get that drying. Okay. So we've also been looking at this at large scales as part of a, a project sponsored by, uh, by DEPI in Victoria. Uh, so we've been uh, surveying sites that are more on the, sale, on the scale of the grid cell. Um, so we've got uh, four main sites in Victoria. So uh, Mount Dandenong is interesting because there's a whole bunch of different forest types, slopes and aspects all in one place. Uh, Mount Grania near Albury is similar but with a different climate. Uh, and Mount Pike we've picked because it's an extinct volcano. It's just about as close as, as you get to a cone in the real world, um, which makes it you know, really simple for looking at slope and aspect. Now we're still in the process of analysing these results, um, but we'll just look first at Mount Dandenong. Uh, so this is just a topographic map, uh, so the, the summit is up here, so we've got uh, a so, uh, convex slope here facing northwest. Uh, down here we've got some deep rainforest gullies, and here we've got more undulating uh, landscape with a, a creek running through the middle of it. And, what we've, and the, the boxes here are the top is surface, the bottom is profile in uh, summer, autumn and winter. So the, what we're seeing is here on the northwest slopes, um, and this was in February this year, so it was you know, extended drought. The northwest slopes, the surface in the profile, are, as you'd expect, extremely dry, all the way to the bottom of the profile. The wet gullies, the surface fuel is dry, but they are still managing to retain a little bit of moisture down in the bottom of the profile. And so you can see there's a strong effect of the, the forest structure on fuel moisture. Uh, and that would of course be of interest if you had a fire burning there to burn very well there, um, but, but less well down there, even in the middle of summer. Uh, looking in, into autumn and winter, you see a similar pattern where as soon as there's any rain, the, the wet sites saturate pretty quickly. Um, whereas the more open sites, although that moisture stays down lower in the profile, um, there's a fairly rapid drying out of the top of the fuel layer. And that's related to the structure of the forest being more open. There's more sunshine, more wind, and the the, uh, the water is able to evaporate more quickly. The reasons for that, well, light environment is part of it. Um, these are canopy photos, one from the top of Mount Dandenong and one from that rainforest gully. Uh, you can see here there's a lot more light getting down to the fuel here than here, so you can imagine that, that would dry out much more quickly. There's also differences in meteorology at a very fine scale. So these are from the Wimberley site, and so you can see that comparing the, the ridge site to the gully site, 
the gully is much cooler, has a much higher humidity, as well as those differences in radiation, and so that's going to affect the, the fuel moisture drying as well. So from here, we, we've got a bit more understanding of, of what's happening out in the field, and so the challenge is to replicate that. Um, so one thing we're doing is working on our process-based modelling to understand more detail about the fine structure. Um, the other thing then is moving on to spatial modelling. So we're starting with some high resolution modelling where we'll uh, use a hydrological model to construct a model of Mount Dandenong and see if we can produce those, those variations. The problem with that is that it takes a lot of computing power to run something at a couple of metres resolution and you can't do that at uh, the scale of the whole state, at least not yet. Um, and so we'll then be looking at, uh, at abstracting away from the landscape and doing something that you could run at a, a six kilometre scale where within a grid cell you might just say, okay, we've got dry sclerophyll on the top of the ridge, uh, wet sclerophyll in the gullies, we'll do those two models and that'll tell you about the range of things that are happening with a grid cell. Uh, and the aim at the end will be an improvement on what we first tried to do with the rural fire service. It'll be a model that's gridded, uh, works with the bomb forecasts, but also takes into account fuel type and topography uh, to understand that smaller scale variation as well. Uh, in terms of what it will look like, something like that, maps of fuel moisture that you can drill down into and get, uh, and get time series for the coming day, whether that's for predicting fire behavior or planning burns. Okay, uh, and yeah, just an advertisement that there's also work being done in, other, in uh, other institutes looking at remote sensing, which will tie hopefully very nicely with, with our modelling work. Um, we're also doing some work looking at whether we can use simpler models, uh, like the Canadian Fine Fuel Moisture Model, can be maybe calibrated and, and run at higher resolutions to get around some of the challenges with our process-based models. Okay, so I've gone on long enough, I think, and happy to take any questions. <laughs>